as doctors and as patients, we're typically trained to look at lab results that are abnormal and always assume those are bad. In today's webinar, I want to ask the question, is an abnormal lab test always a bad thing? Uh, and I would, what you're going to find out is not necessarily, and the way to figure it out whether your abnormal test result is good or bad is to utilize the full context of your case or as the doctor to utilize the full context of a patient's case to interpret that abnormal lab result. And so this can be obviously very important because if a lab abnormal result is treated as a bad thing, then at least in conventional medicine, they're often going to take some sort of clinical action against that lab or abnormality if there is one. What do you mean if there is one? Well, from a conventional medical standpoint, you know, their hammer is always a pharmaceutical. So if you've got an abnormal lab result, if there's a pharmaceutical action to take for that, they will recommend that. If your abnormal lab result is not a bad thing, but they're looking at it as a bad thing, and you take a drug for that, you could possibly be hurt by that. So uh, we want to always remember to look at something not in a vacuum, but look at it in the full context of a case. And let's use a case today from my practice to relate this information to you. And this is just one case. I've actually seen this many times uh, and in many children. So this is one example, but there's been many in my practice. And if there's many in my practice, there's probably many in many practices out there. So we want to be especially aware of this, uh, especially because it's happening in children a lot and because many children suffer with eczema like this child. So this child is a five-year-old girl with eczema that she's had since birth. Um, she she's seen the dermatologist she's seen the allergist she's seen the pediatrician many times uh, the allergist ran skin scratch testing to look for allergies from a skin reaction and that testing showed positive to eggs milk peanut and soy which are very common food allergens and you know if you've got an allergy to those things that could manifest as hives that could manifest as throat swelling, lip swelling, all the way to EpiPen type reactions. It could manifest as eczema and skin rashes and those types of things. And this, and this child, they were contributing likely to the eczema. She also tested positive to dog and cat dander. So, you know, kids love pets. Many, many adults love pets too. And oftentimes I've had patients who know they're allergic to dogs, but they have a dog in the house and it's kind of like well you know i can't i can't perform magic if you're allergic to a dog and you're keeping the dog then um you know matter has limitations and you may you may not get where you want to go until the dog goes somewhere else so that's always something to consider is what are environmental triggers that may be contributing to a given case uh, as with Almost every child that suffers with eczema, this child was put on multiple courses of antibiotics and steroids throughout her young life. Um, dermatology often will recommend antibiotics for eczema. They'll recommend steroids to help put the fire out and, and help the rash. And these things may help short term, but uh, in this patient and many other children that the key words there are short term. They're never, they're never, they never help to completion. And so if a drug works or doesn't work, if a supplement works or doesn't work, if a lifestyle change works or doesn't work in terms of impacting symptoms, then that's a clue for us. And if we're health detectives, then the fact that a steroid helps the eczematous rash uh, intensity and itch and things go away suggests that there is an anti-inflammatory component or and or an immune component there that should be leveraged further and maybe investigated further to determine can we create that change without having to have a five-year-old on um, persistent intermittent steroid use 
And the same thing with antibiotics. If an antibiotic, taking an antibiotic helps lessen the skin rashes and the skin lesions in a case, then that suggests there's a microbial component, specifically bacterial, right? So where can we investigate for bacterial infection? Gut, skin, sinus, bladder, right? Lungs. Um, and then if we investigate there and find infection or infections, are there natural strategies, natural antibacterial strategies we can implement that maybe don't destroy the gut microbiome and uh, or impact the systemic microbiome as much as a systemic antibiotic does. So those are things to consider. And of course, with eczema, uh, this young girl had lots of itching and the red rash lesions, uh, and they were painful. And so, you know, if you've never seen a child with eczema, this is an example. Uh, Here's the back of the legs. Here you can see the eczema on the back of the knees and these lesions on the, the calf. And if we turn the legs over, you see them throughout the shins and over the ankle here and on the top of the foot. So this is very itchy. You can see dry, scaly, um, kind of isn't limited to any specific surface. Eczema can cover the whole body. Eczema could just be local to say the hands or the lips or the eyelids. So it just depends on the person and their unique case. And so this young girl uh, had it all over her body, but I thought the pictures of the legs were sufficient to, to be an example for you. So that's the history. Let's look at some labs. So we moved forward and we ran some labs. And the labs I wanna show you specific to this case are right here. And you might say, why are we testing thyroid for eczema? And we'll get to that. But what I first want you to see is the result. And the result is that there are multiple markers here that are lab high, okay? We can see that, first of all, this is thyroid testing. And I've made multiple videos on thyroid lab testing and interpretation. I'll link to them here so that if you don't know a lot about thyroid, you can watch me walk you through thyroid physiology and thyroid testing and interpretation on another video. But uh, one thing you need to know is that a full thyroid panel is right here. This is a full thyroid panel consisting of eight markers. Conventional medicine typically will only run one marker, thyroid stimulating hormone right here and say that they've done a thyroid panel. That is not true at all. They've done one eighth of a thyroid panel when they do that. So for them to run one eighth of a panel and say you have a normal thyroid or you don't is not good detective work, not good medicine, but unfortunately is standard of care. So what you need to draw away from that is that the standard of care in the US is very low standard, at least in terms of thyroid. So if we just followed conventional medical practices, standard of care, and only ran a TSH, we could have not got as much information from the cases you'll see that we do get because we would have had only the TSH and you would see that this is within normal range. 2.6 falls between 0.6 and 6.2, which this range is very broad. Uh, typically, LabCorp will have a range of between 0.45 and 4.5, okay? And then when you go above 4.5, you're into lab high, and that would be suggestive of hypothyroidism. But at any rate, in this young girl, her TSH was not only in normal range here, but also optimal range. 2.6 is in the optimal range that I use. So again, if we only ran the TSH, we could have been fooled by this because this is optimal. Thankfully, we didn't. We ran the other seven markers. These two right here are antibodies, and both of those were negative, so we know that she does not have thyroid autoimmunity. That's good to see. Uh, this reverse T3 marker here is normal, so that's not an issue for us. But then we come up here, and we see total T4 and free T4 are both lab high. 
and we see total T3 and free T3 are both lab high. So to someone who doesn't have the context of the case and isn't thinking of anything other than thyroid and thyroid test results and what the absolute result on the paper means, if they saw lab high thyroid hormones across the board here, they might say, oh, that person has hyperthyroidism, right? If they're only treating the piece of paper, they know nothing about the slides we covered before this. They don't know the age or sex of the person. They don't know the clinical context. They just look at the piece of paper and are treating based off that. They might say, hey, this person probably has hyperthyroid type symptoms because her thyroid hormones are off the or are lab high outside normal range. And symptoms of hyperthyroidism include anxiety, heat intolerance, heart rate and rhythm issues such as palpitations, uh, could be diarrhea, could be uncontrolled weight loss or inability to gain weight, um, perhaps some bulging of the eyes, things like that, okay? Our patient had none of those symptoms. Uh, and in hyperthyroidism, medically, to diagnose it, they like to see TSH lab low. Okay, so again, medicine wouldn't have run any of these. They wouldn't have seen it. They would have only run TSH and if they ran anything at all in a five-year-old, which they hadn't. Um, but they would have seen this and it would have been normal and they move on. But we see this, lab high. Does she have hyperthyroidism? No, because we've already been through her history and I would have told you that if she did, right? So now the question is, these are all abnormal abnormally high if we're going by normal reference ranges, okay? So the question that we started the call with and the whole purpose of the call is to understand, is are these abnormals abnormal in her case? And so write it down or answer it to yourself right now. If you said, yes, they are abnormal, then I want to help you understand why that answer is incorrect. If you said, no, they're not abnormal, then you're smart because you probably get, um, you probably realized, hey, I'm using this case in a presentation called is an abnormal lab test always bad to show you that it's not. So <laughs> good job figuring that out. All right, but why in the context of eczema, why might, thyroid levels be high, absent hyperthyroidism, and in being high, abnormally high, why, how could that abnormality not be abnormal? What do you see in eczema? Eczema is a skin condition where we have skin damage, right? You're seeing these skin lesions, you're seeing dryness of skin, you're seeing skin turnover. So, that's important. Why would thyroid hormone levels matter in eczema? Because thyroid sets the metabolic rate of every cell in your body. In order for you to have a metabolism as a person, as a whole being, you need optimal thyroid function. Well, for a skin cell to have a metabolism, it needs optimal thyroid function. Thyroid sets the metabolic rate of every cell in your body. So, highly metabolic cells will suffer first, right? Because, or they'll, they'll require more thyroid hormone because they have a higher metabolism. What are highly metabolic cells? Skin, nails, hair, right? Constantly growing and shedding. Gut cells, constant, the gut is constantly moving or should be if it's healthy. Um, the brain never shuts off. Your heart never shuts off, right? So these cells are constantly putting a demand out for thyroid because they're never turning off. They're always functioning at a high rate relative to other cells that are not functioning at this high rate. So if we're looking at an eczema case, these are skin cells that are constantly damaged, constantly turning over. So they're going to constantly have a higher demand for thyroid, right? They're going to, there's, this is, you know, yes, it's a sign of inflammation and pain and itching and redness, but what you can draw from that is that these cells are constantly 
being sloughed off or lost. So they constantly have to be replaced. So a, a different way you could perceive these, these wounds or these lesions is these are areas of high skin cell turnover or high metabolism. And this little girl, you're just seeing the legs, but the entire body looks like this. So if the whole body looks like this, wouldn't it make sense that there's going to be a high demand for thyroid hormone, a high demand for the ability to metabolically replace those cells, right? So in that context, these lab highs are not abnormal for her. They're actually appropriate. They're a good sign. They're saying, hey, her thyroid is appropriately producing the hormones that are allowing her to turn skin over and make new skin when those eczema lesions happen, right? So if we look at that as appropriate in the context of her case, then we can say, well, how do we know if I'm right? How do I know she doesn't have hyperthyroidism? Well, first of all, she's not showing any signs of hyperthyroidism or symptoms. So that's the first giveaway. But secondly, I can prove that I'm right by, by being successful in her case. If we take action in her case and her skin lesions uh, regress or not regress, but improve and heal, then if these lesions go away and heal and are replaced by normal, healthy skin, well, then that would take the high demand and lower it, right? So if we have healthy skin and lower demand, that would allow this appropriately over-functioning thyroid to meet that demand. If there's less demand, the thyroid can calm back down and these numbers can drop to normal range. So the way to know if we're right or not is to take action, of, you know, and assuming we take the correct action and the patient heals, then we can retest and observe the thyroid hormone numbers. And if the thyroid hormone numbers drop back down to normal, then we know we were right. And we know that that was an appropriate adaptation by her thyroid and by her body to keep up with the demand of skin cell turnover that was part of her eczema. So I hope this is helpful in helping you understand one instance on how and why an abnormal lab result is not always abnormal and why it's very important to take the entire case into context before you reflexively just treat a piece of paper. Rather than treat the piece of paper, we want to work with the whole patient and observe for change, not only in the skin in this case, but also in the labs so that we know that we're on the right track.